what we're really talking about is the creation of an econog layer internet. Hello, I'm Jeremy Allaire, and this is The Money Movement. I'm really excited today to have as a guest, Alex Tapscott, who is a author and thinker and speaker, and I think really someone who has helped on a more popular basis understand blockchain technology now for almost a decade and recently published his latest book, Web3, Charting the Internet's Next Economic and Cultural Frontier, topics that are near and dear uh, to, to me. Uh, Alex, uh, really great to have you on The Money Movement. Yeah, great to see you, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, you know, uh, I, I want to use this episode um, really to, yeah, I want to pursue some of the ideas in, in the book, of course, and there's sort of, sort of some themes that I think uh, I'm really passionate about that we can kind of riff on. But um, I also view this hopefully as an opportunity to, to you know, kind of create a, a, a narrative and a piece of content that can help a lot of people who are really not close to this. I mean, we're really up close and know this extremely well, but um, you know, I, I find, you know, traveling around the world, interacting with a lot of different constituencies, whether it's in the media or in government or just civil society, you know, when people say Web3 and there's this, you know, Web3 is this next iteration of the internet, it often leads to like blank stares, right? right. And, and you know, I think like there's a lot of jargon out there. Web 2.0 was like jargon uh, back when we were doing, you know, blogs and the birth of social media and online media and stuff like that. And so yeah. to some degree, right, no one really cared about Web 2. They cared about that they were using Facebook or Twitter or they were blogging or, you know, they could get, you know, YouTube or <laughs> whatever the, the, the killer apps of, of Web 2 were. But I do think that Web3 really gets at a fundamental change on the internet, like a very, very fundamental change. And I think it's an op there is an opportunity here to really, on a mass market basis, help explain this next evolution of the internet. So given your, uh, your, your, your own uh, you know, journey here, maybe you could start very high level with uh, you know, your, your best two minute rendition of, uh, of, of what you think web three represents. <laughs> sure. Starting the timer now. Well, I, you know, I think the future is bright, but it's not always clear. And I think when it comes to web three, there's been a lot of fresh mud that has gotten slung onto the windshield and, and clouded people's view. So yeah, you know, my, my hope is that the new book, uh, will help to reset the conversation about web three by highlighting the ways in which it's, you know, changing the world in positive ways. So yeah, the, the two minute summary, well, um, you know, the first era of the web, what in jargon we call the read web, but I think what a lot of people remember is the dot com era was basically a medium for the presentation of information on static websites. So you log on, you know, you, you type in a URL, you could see a website, you could see images, you could see text, but you didn't typically interact with it. You were uploading your own stuff. And you weren't really using the web as a way to, you know, find a community or publish information. Still, despite that, it was uh, revolutionary because it democratized access to information, at least for people who had, you know, an internet connection, which is a big if. Um, web 2, which we've kind of been living with for the better part of two decades, changed the web from a broadcast medium to a collaborative medium. Basically a way for people not only to access stuff, but to share their own content, to share their ideas, photos. Uh, recipes, you know, you name it, and to find like-minded communities online. And in a way, it was successful in doing that. You know, Web2 broadened the number of people who used the internet and gave a platform to people who maybe didn't have a way to access an audience. So in, in a sense, it kind of democratized access to publishing, but it came at a very steep cost. What happened in Web2 was that large platforms captured most of the value, user-generated data became the most important asset class, and all of the wealth creation happens at the platform level and not at the user level. And I think in a way, I th the, the idea of the web as a decentralized open network um, was kind of unfulfilled by what happened in Web 2. So enter Web 3, what they call the read, write, own web. So now not only is the web a way to access content or to publish information and find your community, but it's also a way to basically own the digital asset class. Um, of this age, own our own data, own our own digital creations, 
and to be able to own and control assets, financial assets like money, but anything really of value in a way that I think puts hand, a power into the hands of, of internet users at the expense of platforms, gives them more freedom and autonomy and more privacy online. And I think in a way that helps to both fulfill the original vision of the web, but also add to it. Because now we have this economic layer that I think, like all other eras of the web, is going to be transformational for business, but also for, for culture, society, and much else. Okay, that's great. I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> two minutes, it was pretty good. Uh, it, was, it was pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I think um, it, it's really interesting. I, as you know, uh, have myself sort of been through the web 1.0, web 2.0, and kind of this web 3.0 kind of world and building infrastructure throughout. And um, yeah, I think something that you've just touched on and, and I think is, is animated throughout the book as well is this idea that there's like an economic layer of the internet uh, that, you know, there hasn't been uh, an actual economic layer on the internet. It's been, there's been an information layer, a data layer, a communications layer. To some degree, there's been a transaction layer in terms of people, you know, conducting e-commerce, but this idea that we're moving the actual foundation of the economy, the economic system onto the internet, it, I think it's a big idea. And, yeah. um, and, 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 it, and, you know, you really need to step away from crypto and Bitcoin and, and, you know, a, a lot of the things that if, if, if you start talking about this, you know, with, with the average person, right. And you start saying web three, what is web three? Well, it's building on, you know, crypto technology and blockchain. And then people just start to go, no, you're, you're talking about that crazy gambling, yeah. criminal stuff or whatever, you know, whatever the, the filter is. Right. But at a, at a fundamental technical level, economic layer internet. I'd love to explore that a little bit with you. It's in the title of the book, obviously, as well. Yeah. Like, what is that economic layer? I, I, you, you mentioned like this is, there's ownership or there's having ownership of your data or there's having ownership of your, of your identity or having ownership of, of, of value. But, but specifically, like, what does it mean to have a new economic layer on the Yeah, absolutely. Well, for those folks who, who hear the word cryptocurrency in and Bitcoin and, and, you know, start to get confused about Web3. You know, the, the, the way that I sort of describe it basically is that it's true that having thousands and thousands of cryptocurrencies isn't a particularly useful thing because, you know, currency is supposed to be something specific, a unit of exchange and, uh, you know, or a medium of exchange. Currency is a misnomer. I, I yeah. In other words, currency is a misnomer. What, what these digital assets are trying to be is lots of different things. And so I think that term, the term token, even though the, the, the term token is a little lighthearted, you know, a token of my appreciation, I actually think it's a very appropriate term yeah. to describe this. Digital thing. tokens. Right. Digital tokens. And a token can best uh, be thought of as just a container for value. So in the same way a shipping container can contain, you know, most goods, you know, a computer, a car, food, and so forth, a token can be programmed to represent anything of value. And in the same way that the intermodal shipping container increased economic activity by four or 500%, depending on which study you look at, the same I think will be true for tokens. Tokens are a standard unit that allow us to move and store value um, peer to peer. And that can be any kind of asset. In the case of Circle, it can be US dollars, which have clearly found product market fit at over 130 billion of circulating supply for the whole market. But it can be anything else that can be programmed uh, into a token. So that economic layer starts fundamentally with the idea of the asset itself, the token. Now, in terms of what it means in practice, well, I think it means that, you know, individuals have more autonomy and more control uh, over their economic lives online. You know, if the desktop was the way we access Web 1 and the smartphone was how we access Web 2 primarily, you know, um, I think of the wallet as the sort of interface uh, in a way for Web 3. And in the same way that your wallet, your physical wallet, can contain things of value like money, but also ways to prove aspects of your identity, you know, your driver's license in Canada, where we have universal healthcare, a health card, uh, which allows you to get, you know, healthcare any hospital in the country. Um, the same can be true for Web3 and wallets. So you have a way to have custody and control over your assets, your value, but also credentials and other parts of your data. And that's going to, I think, change the dynamic between plat like internet services and users. 
One example of this, you really know well, is the DeFi space. So DeFi is this area of Web3. It, it, what DeFi is its own frontier within Web3, where smart people are trying to reimagine financial services from the ground up. You know, we hear a lot about fintech, and I think a lot of fintech is mostly just digital wallpaper. It's a way to sort of make the experience of accessing the old world. I look that far impolite. I say lipstick on a pig. Yeah, well, there you go. But like under the surface, you know, you've got all the same infrastructure. It's still the same pig, right? Um, and so with DeFi, what, what people are trying to do is reimagine from the ground how we move value, how we store value, how we access credit, how we trade, how we organize financial information, how we do identity, you know, like credit scoring even, all of this stuff from, from the ground up. But what's different about DeFi is that DeFi turns users into owners. So the more you use a DeFi platform, the more of that platform you own. So a good example is something like Uniswap. So Uniswap is a decentralized exchange. Instead of having a central order book like NASDAQ or you know, the Toronto Stock Exchange, it's a smart contract that connects buyers and sellers. So it can have a theoretically unlimited number of trading pairs. But in order for trading pairs to be useful, you need market depth, you need liquidity. And so Uniswap basically incentivizes people who are large traders on the platform or liquidity providers um, with ownership in the platform. So the more you contribute to something, the more of it you own. And so in a way, these, these platforms, which are worth billions of dollars, even in this market that we're in, um, are entirely, pretty much entirely user-owned. And so to me, that's the concept we can then apply to other applications and services. You know, I don't think that Facebook is about to turn itself into some user-owned network or Uber is going to turn itself into some driver-owned network or something like that. But I think that the next iteration of, of services and applications will start with that premise. Indeed, they already have in DeFi, but I think yeah. they will in other areas. And I'll just add one more thing, which is, you know, other than ownership is great, uh, what's the purpose of this? Well, if you wanted today to basically make owners out of your users and you were a traditional corporation and you were, let's say, a software company launching in 50 countries at once, you could not do it. Like you would have to do options agreements in 50 countries in a dozen languages and have lawyers enforcing the terms and so forth. Yeah. But, with, but with a token-based model, you can create an easy way to align the incentives of users, developers, and other contributors with the platform itself. And I just think like we've seen it work in several areas within Web3, and I believe it's something that will get applied much more to other parts of the web. Yeah, I, I think it's good explanations. And I, I think like helping people from like, you know, the way in which you can kind of dramatically restructure uh, our experience of things, you know, by, by moving to these sort of fully internet native models, it, you know, by analogy, right? You know, I, I think um, when, you, when you made it possible for anyone just to, with a mobile device to download a piece of software and participate in, in massive global communications networks, right? It, it, it wasn't so much like, oh, I'm replacing my telephone company. It's just like, no, this is just like this radically better thing where yeah. there's, you know, whether it's WhatsApp groups and it's, you know, it's, it's messenger groups and it's, you know, all, all of these kind of, you know, things like that, or, you know, pe people weren't sort of saying like, well, I really want to have a new, um, you know, a, 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 a new entertainment network. Well, no, the one was created by people having something like Instagram or TikTok, like basically creators, you know, creating them probably these two things, probably the biggest entertainment platforms ever created in the history of humanity and, and, and where it's user, user driven, right? So I think people can relate to the user driven nature of this. And, and it can also be at a, you know, at, at not just the mass consumer level, right? It can be very, very specific ways. It, it, it could be, you know, there's, you know, as you'd write about in the book as well, there can be these DAOs or basically these decentralized organizations of people of shared purpose, shared interest, or that are working towards common goals that happen to find themselves connected on the internet. And now they have a way to structure their work, to structure ownership, compensation, economic arrangements, and all that can be done entirely directly on the internet on a multinational, truly open basis. And, and so I, I like to think about, um, you know, Web3 as sort of creating 
um, you know, new building blocks for us as you, again, capturing a little bit of the title of the book, new building blocks for society and the economy to construct new ways to make things, new ways to participate uh, in, in, in economic value um, or artistic value or in all, all these different domains. There's really, you know, and, and at the foundation of it are, yes, it's digital tokens, smart contracts, uh, wallet technology. And, and so in many ways, that part of it, the, the technology part of it, tokens, smart contracts, stable coins, wallets, like that's going to increasingly go into the background. Uh, it's just like pipes and plumbing and stuff and developers will care a lot about it. They'll care about a lot about those things, about making sure that they're fast and reliable and safe and globally available and, 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 you know, trusted and, all of those things, like the, the, I almost think about that as like, you know, developers care about iOS and Android, but users just care that they've got great applications that just, that, that work and sing, right? So I think the Web3 technology, while it's, it's, it's front and center for people like us, it'll go in the background. And, and what we'll end up with is, you know, these just completely new capabilities that society is interacting that they haven't had before. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, you know, just like we had with Web2, right? No one asked, uh, no, one, no one sort of thought, oh, there's going to be a decentralized uh, transportation and logistics system that people just use with GPSs and touchscreens and, and, and mo mobile uh, applications. Like that, that got created and then it was like a new capability for society to orchestrate transportation, right? Same kind of thing here. These apps are going to surface and, and you know, the creators are going to kind of think through what to build and we're really in the early stages of that exploration, obviously. That, that reminds me of a very famous quote from Clay Christensen, where he said that markets that do not exist cannot be analyzed. Not, are, not only are they unknown at the time of their creation, they're unknowable. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. You know, when the first era of the web came along and people were looking at it, I think a lot of the early examples were what they call skeuomorphic, right? meaning yeah. sort of rooted in the old w way of doing PDF of the New York Times front page. Yeah, exactly. It's classified sports yeah. scores, et cetera. But yeah. all of these other sort of social apps or geospatial apps, as you're described, you know, Uber, I don't think we're on the, there were smart people probably thinking ahead, but most, most people, that was not part of their, you know, mm -hmm. vision for what the internet was. The internet was a broadcast medium for information that anyone could access. It was of dubious quality because anyone could upload stuff, right? I mean, right. just didn't so, Oh, and it was the worldwide wait and dial-up modems were terrible and yeah. Windows was buggy and it was like really bad. Exactly. So I actually think of like Web3 and I see some of the early examples, you know, it's a cliche, but if email was the first sort of killer app of the web, then maybe Bitcoin was sort of that first killer app of, of, I like to think stable coins of Web3. Well, you know, in a way you're probably right about that um, because, and, and stable coins, I mean, <laughs> I mean this as a compliment. They're kind of a skeuomorphic thing in a way. It's like, look, we're going to take this, we're going to take this token, this, this, this artifact, and we're going to do something with it that we know the world wants. Everybody in the world wants a U.S. dollar bank account, and everyone wants a way to move and store value where they can control it, where they are not subject to inflation or corrupt banking or corrupt governments, where they have autonomy. Okay, let's deliver that service, right? And so, yes, there's clear problems. Do you know they want though is programmable, composable, open, interoperable money as well, right? Well, that, and the, the part that they don't know that they want, what I call latent aspiration, right? The latent aspiration is actually like this extraordinarily high velocity programmable, programmable money. Yeah. But that's the web three. That's really the web three unlock, right? As opposed yeah. to like, oh, it's, it's, it's just a better version of wires and PayPal. Well, don't, don't sell yourself short. Like, a better version, a far better version of how people move doll U.S. dollars around the world is kind of a big market. But I agree with you that all that other stuff is, is um, you know, where we go from there. It's sort of like everybody in the world wants a U.S. dollar bank account. And once they have it, what else do they want? They want a U.S. dollar investment account or they want a way to use sure. it. They want to borrow and lend or they want to conduct, they want to enter into economic contracts. They want to supply their labor and get compensated. They want to they want to make things and sell things and distribute things. And, you know, they want to be in the digital economy. Yes, exactly. Now we can intermediate the economy, the real economy in software yeah. uh, with 
smart contracts and 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 these web web three primitives as well. well. That's something we said with blockchain revolution. It's like in all likelihood, this this should be more impactful than the prior prior eras of the web. Because I've been saying that since I started the company, that was actually one of the reasons why I started Circle. Is literally I was like, I think this is going to be bigger than the web over the long run. And yeah. Want to, I want to get started now. It was 10 years ago. It was early, right? I want to get started now because there's going to take a while, but I think the, the ultimate impact of this should be far, far greater than the web because the web is just about information and this is about the actual economy. Yeah, that's right. And so on the democratization front, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit is um, now we all have a way to move value peer to peer. And it could be, you know, right now, US dollar stable coins are the ones that have found product market fit. But I think that there will be other, you know, obviously other assets will expand that franchise for people who want different stuff. But bigger picture, like what that means is that we can have people in disparate parts of the world all connected into the same economy and, and operating on a somewhat more level playing field. You know, I'm not like uh, delusional. We live in a very unequal world. But if the, if the internet, you know, the first eras of the web, you know, made it so that people could access information and publish and whatever... Yeah. Then, then what Web3 does is it empowers them with a different kind of toolkit, a way to move value, store value, and maybe build wealth. And that was the part that you said, which is like get compensated in the asset. So if you have a way to, you know, to trade your labor for money for a global distributed organization that right. doesn't really care if you're in Lagos or Manila or Toronto, then all of a sudden, you know, you have a way to kind of plug into a labor market that doesn't exist at the and now we have a payment tool to ensure you get compensated. Now that's going to create, that's a good thing. I think we, we have to sort of say that. But there's also all sorts of negative externalities from that potentially. Um, one is what happens to the software engineer in Toronto <laughs> if, uh, if there's someone in, you know, another part of the world. More competition. It's global. It's less. Could, could, could improve the whole, could grow the pie. Like I, that's my view generally when it comes to these things. But it could on the meantime cause some dislocation. There's another thing too that I'm kind of so curious about, which is, what does this mean for governments in those countries? You know, I was on a panel in uh, the Middle East a year ago, and it was me, Nouriel Roubini, and the governor of the Bank of Pakistan at the time, who's no longer in the role. And he was saying how they were considering a ban on all digital assets. And that would, that would be foolish for many reasons, because, you, you know, limiting all this innovation and tokens that have to do with lots of different things. But his main concern was dollarization, which yeah. is already the... You know, people are that the, they have less control over the money supply and uh, you know the um, balance of accounts than they would like. And what happens if everyone starts using U.S. dollars? And that's the same thing that's true in in Nigeria as well. In the book, I actually talk about a company called Acorapay, which helps uh, companies that operate in the in Africa repatriate dollars to the United States. Mm -hmm. and, these are, can be big companies, like, you know, hypothetically, but like Coca-Cola or Colgate or something like that. And the easiest way to do that is actually to, um, to exchange the local currency into USDC and USDT and then repatriate it in the United States. It's a way to do it like within sort of seconds or minutes or what have you at that yeah. cost. And so I always thought that was interesting. And to me, that's, that's like an example of like taking the Web3 toolkit and putting it into regular business. But the more interesting insight from him was um, that all of his employees, if given the, the opportunity, would prefer to get paid in USDC or USDT or even Bitcoin, even though it has its volatile right. is Naira versus Naira, because they view it as a better store of value. And in the case of US dollars, it's actually more fungible, like it's more useful for a yeah. lot of things, which is surprising, I think, to a lot of people. The dollar's got more network effects. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. US dollar, exactly. So, you know, it's, it's, there, this will have an impact that is um, positive, but also straight yeah. affected. And who knows how it's all going to kind of shake it. I think if you really kind of drive deeply into that, the, the, the sort of uh, what I almost think of as like systems of monetary policy, systems of law, systems of governance, like these are the monetary systems, the legal systems, contractual systems, uh, uh, you know, governance systems like th these are um these are systems that basically until recently have only existed offline they've only existed in mostly in kind of human mediated bureaucracies 
um, and on paper, literally, right? Uh, and, and, and in some ways, um, society's never had the toolkits to manifest governance, contracts, ownership, and, 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 and monetary you know, mechanisms of, of, of the monetary system. They've n never had the actual toolkits to do those entirely in, in software and do those at internet scale and do that with, with the reach of every, every device in the world, right? So that's like, to me, that's like the massive inflection point that Web3 represents is we have these toolkits. We can actually, like clean slate, I love DAOs, just as an example. If you take a clean slate and you sort of say, hey, I want to create a global organization and I want to enlist people to contribute to that organization. I want to make widgets uh, and, and they could be, they could be uh, 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 a knowledge output and like a knowledge worker output. It could be something that's created that is itself digital or informational or software or, or, or what have you. It could be, I want to design, I, I want to design, uh, I want to do architecture. I want to build a global architecture firm or whatever it is. And I want to create that. And I want all the participants to participate in it through a system of governance that's mediated by tokens and smart contracts. And I want the entire treasury, meaning the money of that organization to be all managed and intermediated by smart contracts on a blockchain using safe digital dollar cash instruments in, in a treasury system. And if I have people who work for me, I want the labor contracts implemented in code and I want my invoices and trade agreements implemented in code. And if I need to borrow capital, I can let someone see with zero knowledge proofs what my cash flows have been. And then it can, someone can write credit against it and I can borrow money and I can employ people everywhere as long as they have a smartphone or an internet connection and people can contribute value. They can produce things and they can make, they can participate in decisions and you, you literally can take governance, you know, contracts, money, and you can operate that entirely as that digital organization. And th that to me is in, you know, I think it might be over the next 10 to 20 years, you know, like you said, Web 2.0 has taken us 20 years to where we are today. Like over the next 10 to 20 years, that's what I'm excited to see. I want to see breakthrough organizations that get created that just couldn't be created under the existing realm. And then, you know, to your point about governments and what happens that whether it's positive or negative externalities, like governments will have to adapt, right? Because then people in their societies are saying, hey, this is a better, this is a better system. I, I want to be in this system. Just like governments didn't stop, you know, audio streaming because they wanted to control audio broadcast in their country. They just, they sort of said, okay, anyone can broadcast to my people in my country. I can't stop that now. It's genies out of the bottle. What, what do we do? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in seeing those kinds of organizational innovations uh, evolve as well. Well, so am I. And I mean, it's a, you, you, you outlined it so well. In a way, this makes sense that there should be a new way to organize and govern value and resources for the digital age, because there was also a new way to organize and govern value for the industrial age. It was called okay, the Joint Stock Corporation. Joint Stock Corporation. You know, like a little history lesson for listeners. It's like the first Joint Stock Corporations really were formed to, during the age of exploration because it was extremely risky to send a bunch of ships out into the middle of nowhere and hope that they return. But if you pooled all that risk across a bunch of different people, then, you know, everyone only stood to lose a little bit, right? And that also led to the creation of the modern insurance business. You know, Lloyd's of London was a coffee shop <laughs> where people would basically, you know, underwrite policies on ships. That was all the, the that was the only business in town was shit. And the stock could be traded on an exchange. That's right. And then you get all this other stuff. And then yeah. it's all of this. All, it all kind of, it all kind of comes from that, right? And so like in a way, like the joint stock corporation is like the killer app for uh, un industrial age undertakings. You know, you need yes. to, you need to build a railroad or, or a coal mine or a steelworks or something. You need a, a, a mechanism to do that. You couldn't do that with a sole proprietorship. You right. need a joint stock company with a limited liability. So that makes perfect sense. But now we're in a digital age yeah. where a lot of new innovation is happening as software, as networks that are yeah. 
that are maybe a bit more capital light than, you know, industrial undertakings. So you need a new asset class and a new set of tools to govern an organized value. Right. That are global scale by nature. That are, yeah, that, that's right. That are that, that went back to my just my one small example is like, how do you even make everyone an owner in, an, in a global organization under the corporate framework? It's actually impossible. You, you need yeah. this other way to do things. Yeah, so one of the big things that, you know, so I've obviously shared, a lot of shared uh, excitement around all these ideas, right? I, I think one of the things, and it gets to one of the earlier comments is, is um, like the innovators are going to go plow ahead, right? And then governments are going to say, whoa, hold on, right? Um, what you're doing is you're selling a security or what you're doing is, you know, uh, you're, you're forming a, you're forming a corporation and we've got laws on corporations in Delaware or in whatever country you're in. And by the way, we have those laws uh, because we have treasury departments that collect taxes and we got to finance the roads and schools and militaries. And like you know, the, the sort of real world starts to interact and like the ability to collect taxes, enforce you know, dis and, and resolve uh, disputes, like like reality kind of tethers itself to, 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 uh, to all of this. And so I think this is one of the most interesting areas uh, uh, of work, which is, you know, how will courts and how will governments adapt to these new organizational forms? And, and, and will there I, almost certainly there will, but sort of I'm, I'm posing it as a question, but it's also kind of a, a, a how question is, will there be new systems of, of law that adapt to this? And, and um, you know, and, and how, you know, how long is that going to take? Because it, it's going to have to happen, right? We had no systems of law for e-commerce and, and, and the internet that, that have adapted. There's a bit of a laissez-faire approach there, but this feels higher stakes uh, in some cases. But it really feels like for this to take hold, you need to be able to have a way to recognize what a digital entity is and how enforcement of various disputes or other things happen. And um, there's obviously the, the kind of the purest view, which is you could have decentralized courts and you could have decentralized, you know, me mediation and, uh, uh, and the like, and, and maybe that's part of the answer, um, you know, but. Yeah, it's sort of when when reality and the law runs up against the this pure digital economy. Yeah, well, it's something we've seen time and again with other technologies. When the first automobiles were invented, they um, introduced in England these things called red flags, which required every car to have a driver and also a person walking in front of the car waving a red flag. Um, and the reason was that they didn't want to startle horses or pedestrians. So the, the laws in that case were designed to accommodate the old paradigm, not the new paradigm. And those laws were, were repealed. But that to me is an example of what happens when, you know, you regulate too quickly. Um, I would say that in the case of the web, it, it is true that the work, like the first era, it definitely was laissez-faire in the sense that what you said earlier, because it was an information medium, information is regulated. You know, there's an FTC and so on and so forth, but it's way more lightly regulated than than everything else, you know, then that like, you know, there's a freedom of, of speech, which kind of gives broad latitude to people to do a lot of things with information. When it comes to value, I mean, maybe there should be, but I don't know that there's a freedom to transfer value <laughs> in tried law, you know, but governments have that law. Yeah, exactly. So it's highly regulated industry, financial services, you know, incorporating companies, the law, like legal professions, all these things you're describing, you know, governance, contracts and value. Uh, movement are all highly regulated. So, um, you know, uh, Albert Wenger at Union Square Ventures told me and when I interviewed him for the book that the web, the first era of the web had regulatory tailwinds, but he thinks that this next era has regulatory headwinds. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I, I felt some of those breezes uh, over the last years. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm sure that you have. And it's like, yeah, there were some issues in the web. You know, um, I believe that, you know, the first uh, version of Netscape that shipped internationally, they had to take out SSL encryption because it was still weapons grade cryptography. Right. But that, but that got amended. Um, you know, there were people who said that people launch, that if you launch a website, you needed a CB radio license because you were a broadcaster, but that never got off the ground. And in the end, what we ended up with was a set of new laws in the 90s that 
kind of built on or modified what existed before and made it so that the commercial web could really thrive. And I'm, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any attempt to do that, certainly not in the U.S., but even anywhere. Like, I'm not sure anyone's thinking in that, in that kind of way. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I you know, I, um, I would love to see, you know, uh, you know, it, it, like corporate, corporate law, for example, modified to support, you know, d- you know, d- digitally native organizations that don't, you know, and, and I would love to see uh, securities laws and so on amended to uh, allow for like uh, digital tokens as a, as a, as a, as a mechanism. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't have to actually be an equity contract. It can be something else. Right. So I think we, we need, it, we need acknowledgement of some of these things and, and, some of these are clearly, you know, uh, mechanisms of economic uh, investment and value exchange that are equity-like, and and some some of these digital tokens are clearly just information and data, and some of these digital tokens are clearly just you know uh, commodities of, of different types, and so we need we need I think just some statutory definitions for like classifications of different types of digital tokens. And when, when issuing and selling them is, is one activity. So I think that body of work, and I, and I really like to see, again, like corporate law modified, as you've seen, you know, Delaware first, like you keep at a cap table on a blockchain, that was sort of mar- a marginal improvement. And then you have the Wyoming Dow laws, you're seeing some countries create Dow laws. I, I, I think, um, you know, m- m- again, modifying kind of corporate law. So I think the, the, some of these things can happen incrementally. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of adapt to the innovation. Um, and then if, you know, if some of it, if some of that happens and you start to see more scale happening, then, uh, then I think you could see, you know, more rapid progress internationally. And then, you know, some normalization around that. Again, this can be decades, right? This, this doesn't necessarily happen super fast, but it does seem like I have this concept that, um, you know, <laughs> kind of law and policy more or less just follows the will of society. And it's, it's actually, you know, technology innovations and, and social, uh, social and coordination innovations are driven by people and entrepreneurs. And, and that's just what happens. It, it sort of, these things birth and they, and they grow and they take hold and then law and policy adapts to those. Right. So I, I think, there's a push and a pull to that. And, you know, we're seeing that with AI right now, we had decades of work that was completely outside of really any real regulatory, you know, arena at all. And then you hit an inflection point and now, you know, AI is like, it's sort of like the weapons grade encryption back in the day. It's like, okay, we, we, you know, they're looking at ways that you, you might regulate this. Crypto is the same thing. It's a very, very powerful, very, very disruptive technology that just breaks the way in which the old system had been designed. Um, yeah. And so, but these things will keep happening and then law and policy will adapt. So I'm always the optimist and it's just, I'm optimistic over the long run and then yeah. it's sort of you know, how, how, you, how you chip away at it. Well, I'm with you. Um, you know, yeah, the, the, the point about AI is well taken. Every, every technology looks like an overnight success story uh, from the yeah. outside. But, but the reality is they're typically decades in the making. You know, and AI being the, I, to me, AI being the ultimate example of this, you know, Alan Turing, the inventor of cryptography and computing and AI in a way, uh, yeah. by developing the Turing test, was the first to kind of muse on this idea of, of gener- you know, artificial generalized intelligence. And it took 80 years for us to get kind of anywhere close to that. Right. Um, so there's, that's an interesting sort of thing to, to reflect on when you're viewing the, the long arc of history for, for Web3 and crypto. Um, but then the other thing when it comes to, you know, laws and regulation in the book, I say that Silicon Valley was once called the tech Galapagos because of the very unique set of conditions that existed there and nowhere else that led to the species of, you know, companies that, that kind of dominated the first eras of the web. But now those conditions exist ev- elsewhere, not nah. maybe everywhere. And so one place isn't going to necessarily dominate this next era the way it maybe had in the past. And that's certainly true when it comes to a technology and capital and talent perspective. But on a regulatory perspective, you know, we still have uh, governments are extremely important stakeholders and laws matter. And, you know, I think to your point, if you actually want this stuff to reach its potential, the law needs to adapt to it to, to, to create the conditions. And, and as someone, you and I both have this in common, which is we talk to enterprises like big companies 
And most big companies won't invest in a new technology over the long run in a regulatory vacuum. Uh, I mean, they want clarity, right? So, so I don't think it's enough to say, well, if it doesn't happen here, it'll just happen somewhere else. I mean, I think if that's true, but it, it, for it to reach its potential, it needs to happen everywhere. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And I, um, I was on a panel yesterday and you know, the, the, the final question, it had to do with the, the adoption of like stable or digital dollars or, or whatever. And, um, and um, uh, the, the, the last question was, you know, what's the most important thing that needs to happen in 2024 for this to, you know, achieve the mainstream scale? And um, one of the panelists was a former regulator and a lawyer, a very prominent person. And they were like, you know, legal certainty. We need to have legal certainty uh, because if we have legal certainty and we, we've created these laws, then like, exactly what you said, like corporations and households and financial institutions, they'll know where they stand. They know what this is. They know how to treat this and use this. Um, and I think that's true. So that is like, that has to happen. I'm of course a technologist. So my answer was, you know, all about technology and, and, and sort of technology for the conversation we've just had, right? I, I, I view if the technology progress continues, then the law has to follow. Right? It just like, right. it, get, yeah. it gets so usable that, you know, anyone can download a piece of software and without knowing anything about crypto or blockchains or witch chain or gas fees or any of the, you know, stuff that makes this, you know, complex and early adopter technology that just fades into the background and you're just transacting in digital dollars as seamlessly as you're using WhatsApp and yeah. then happens and a billion people just start using it. You're going to have legal certainty really fast yeah, you know, because, yeah. you know, you, you're not going to have a choice. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think, you know, that that's, that's certainly what, uh, you know, part of what we, what we hope to see. Um, you know, one, one of the other themes that, uh, that you touch on as well in the book, and I just thought it'd be, it'd be kind of fun to talk about is there's a lot of the utility that comes in that a lot of really exciting new forms of utility that can come with like digital tokens in web three. And yeah. With if if you're an enterprise or you're a brand or you're a retailer or you're a media company or an entertainment company or just a plain vanilla widget maker, um, like there's a lot there's a lot of really um, exciting things that can happen and and frankly don't even need necessarily a lot of regulatory clarity because you know NFT technology is like a general purpose technology that can be used to do a lot of things. Um, may, maybe you could just talk for a minute about. You know, what are, what are, you know, what's the low hanging fruit? If you're, if you're advising, as I'm sure you do many corporations, you know, what's the low hanging fruit that isn't like, go build a, you know, go build a room in a metaverse. It's just like, what, what, what can I actually, what can I use te this technology to do that can activate my business in some new way? Yeah, totally. Well, I think before I answer that question, it's, it's important to just talk about the evolution of what enterprises have done in this space. So in the very early days, you know, meaning like six years ago. Yeah. Um, they, they, they love the idea of, you know, uh, shared record of truth and, you know, tokens and so forth, but they didn't like the idea of opening themselves up to public blockchain infrastructure because they viewed it as sort of a little too early for prime time. Right. And in a way that's very reminiscent of what happened during the early era of the web with intranet. Yeah. Like the idea of the internet, but they didn't want to go to that place where all those, you know, libertarians and, and yahoos were. Sounds it's familiar. You know, it's not for sound. Uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, or maybe it just repeats in this case. But anyway, the point is that nowadays, uh, most enterprises, when they try to do something in this space, they're, they're doing it on public infrastructure. So that's a big plus, you know, and like circle most, I think most of your circulating supply is oh, here at Ethereum based and, uh, and on other public chains, you know, Cosmos, Solana, et cetera. Um, so that's, you know, your example, you're an example of that, but even like uh, traditional legacy companies. Um, that's where they're doing right, Starbucks NFTs or whatever. Starbucks NFTs, like, you know, oh, I got them. LVMH, Tiffany's, CryptoPunks collaborations, you know, uh, Solana merchant settlement um, for Visa, yeah. PYUSD, also Ethereum main chain. Yeah. So a lot of it's, it's all happening on public blockchain. So I think that's an important thing to just remind ourselves of, except for like JP Morgan and Citibank and those, those groups, they, they seem to be still doing their own thing, which... You know, I even view that as a positive because it's part of the journey. Oh, there's still, um, there are still like proprietary, physically separated, segregated wide area networks that are used for the military or whatever. And like, they need to do that, right? They don't need the, they're not going to use the public internet always. So there is always going to be that segmentation. But I think 
the scale opportunities, right? Or when yeah. you get internet scale and internet reach. Yeah, exactly. And so the, so to me, it's, you know, you, you, why do you do it? Well, you do it to create a new product service or tap into a new customer segment or market that you couldn't before, basically. Um, and so, you know, I look at the example of, of Nike with Artifact and Dot Swoosh. Yeah. You know, Nike, what, what, what's, what business is Nike into? It's in the business of, you know, honoring creators and athletes pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, having ways for you as a customer to express your, you know, alignment with those brands. That can really be in the physical or the digital world. And in fact, as more and more young people spend time online, and if, you know, prognosticators are right, that eventually we'll have a spatial web and, you know, our avatars will be a big part of our lives, then of course your presentation of digital self is going to be as important as your yeah. present of self. So, you know, being able to, to get ahead of that with, um, you know, c collections of digital uh, assets that do the same thing that, you know, sneakers do, that's basically an example. Steve Jobs once said, you know, shoes are a commodity. So why is Nike worth so much money? It's like, they're not a shoe company. They're in the business. I stole that from them. They're in the business of honoring creators now. Yeah. Um, you know, and so there's lots of ways to do that. Same with luxury brands. Like what are luxury brands in the business of? Selling uh, scarcity, pretty much. Um, artificial scarcity. And maybe this is a bit cynical, but, you know, they, they make fewer items, sell them for more money to create the illusion of scarcity. And digital goods are a way to create scarcity. Um, and then more fundamentally, you know, the, the big payments companies uh, who are interested in stable coins, I find, I've, I've always found their foray into this space kind of amusing because it's like, oh, PayPal's here. Now stable coins are, you know, they're, they're being adopted by the big guys. I'm like, have you seen Circle and Tether? These, these come you remember? Disney Go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, the guys get involved, they launch these big initiatives and then what happens? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like, uh, FYI, this is a massive market that's been around for, you know, several years. And, um, you know, you might have a hard time actually catching up with the new guys. I mean, so, so just to, to, re to finish the thought, um, what I'm seeing is A, public blockchains, B, what I view is like the Web3 toolkit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember the old pilots from 2015, 16. It was always trying to boil the ocean. You know, let's move our whole trade settlement for our entire, you know, business onto some proprietary closed blockchain. It's like, that was never going to really happen. Um, what they needed to do was to experiment and like start by experimenting, but become more and more broad commercial applications of the toolkit. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's kind of how I view it today with Web3. They're reaching into the toolkit to, to create new product services, target new markets or access new markets. And like, that's a very good thing because all of that is helping to drive both uh, user adoption, enterprise adoption, and in the end is going to help to scale the technology too. That's awesome. Well, I, uh, I know we're coming up on time. We've covered a lot of ground uh, here and, and uh, I'm, we can talk for hours um, and, uh, you know, really, really appreciate you coming on. I feel like, um, you know, this is, a, this is an exciting moment. I, I really feel like this is an exciting moment. And, um, you know, I remember the transition from web 1.0 to web 2.0 and, you know, there was sort of like, you could feel it. And like, and then people are turning on their broadband connections and you're like, and the, the software was getting better. And like, you're like, this is, you could really, really feel it. And yeah. I feel like that's right where we are with, with web three. It's like the broadband is just getting turned on and people are really starting to build more interesting things. And, and if I go back to like 2003, 2002, 2003, 2004, which is sort of the early stages of web, web two, like, I think that's kind of where we are. And. And it really accelerated fast after that. It, it accelerated dramatically over like the next five to 10 years. So I think uh, we'll have a lot to reflect on uh, together in the coming years. I look forward to it. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jeremy.